This conference will now be recorded. Do we know if Howard's coming or not? I haven't heard from Howard in a while. He's usually on okay. first, so, you know, we'll see. It's already five after, so I suspect he's not. Yeah, I mean, they're getting super busy. Yeah, I think he's just playing a lot, he's playing a lot of pickleball. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you should see my screen now. All good. Okay. This first one is just a little bit of a scary case. Um, but I'll show you. This was, I don't remember why this was being done. I think this patient had some sort of extra thoracic tumor. Um, but had, in a few years ago, had this thing right here. And this was correctly, you know, called as you know, possible nodule. And I think if you just looked at it on one of these axial images, you might blow it off as a as an intrapulmonary lymph node because it is almost rectangular here. But then you scroll and see the margins. It's a little irregular up top and certainly along the lower margin, it's a little bit fuzzy. And so attention was brought to that and they continued to watch it. And then a few months later, you'll see it is bigger. And certainly not anything that looks benign now it has little regular margins to it or maybe some speculation and then um, this is the last one and i'll just show you you know that's a full-blown adenocarcinoma now and that's been biopsy proven but uh yeah it's just a i thought this was a good you know just i don't want to say mimic of an intrapulmonary lymph node but a good cautionary case of, of not over calling lymph nodes what do you guys think yeah i call a lot of lymph nodes <laughs> um yeah do you have, can you show sagittal Sure. And it is, I mean, it's a centimeter. Of course, lymph nodes can be a centimeter. Let me, absolutely. Let me NPR this one. It is a yeah. little, it's not smooth, which is a little bothersome, but of course I'm biased because I already know what it is. But sure. It's going to look too. like ERs because usually they're, they're somewhat flat. Yeah, exactly. Right. They're going to be flat in some plane, like a disc shape or something. Right. And this one is, you know. Yeah, I don't like see. it. It's, it's convex in two planes. Yep. Yeah, and that's why I just show it. It's like a added to the not lymph node, you know, especially this coronal. Yeah, it definitely has some substance to it. It's not just like a little, it's not a flat little bean or disc or whatever you want to call it. Right. So, yeah. And, the, and like the projection that you got that you added here, I think is very helpful because I was going to blow this off as a little bit of round atelectasis because it's sitting right on the pleura. It's, it's got almost a yep. comet. Going into it, <clears throat> so that's what I would have. Been. Yeah, but I, so. I think the, the image on the left here really does not look like round atelectasis. So I think that's the most helpful image. That's the most nodular look to the thing. Yep, I agree. Uh, yeah, it's just a just thought. The more of these types of examples we can show, the better. And yet, to Jeff's point. You know, when we're scrolling through on axials, usually they're gone within a couple of slices if they're flat, obviously, if they're one millimeter or 1.25 or whatever. That always helps in real time when you're scrolling through. I think the, the lymph nodes sometimes have a kidney shape to them, too, a little bean-like. Yeah. yeah, it was uh, the most recent paper that was looking at some of them was, I think it was LOS, like lentiform oval or... I don't know. They had some abbreviation, but yeah, we, right. Oval, lentiform, triangular, kidney bean shaped. Right. Any of those. All right. Here's, here's an interesting one, which I didn't, I was not familiar with this genetic entity. Uh, and David, this case, it, it reminds me, I, I remember you showed a case of, I think it was somebody from Mexico who was very young, who developed mesothelioma. Right. Uh, with known like exposure to asbestos, I guess one of the asbestos mining area or whatever. Uh, to cut to the chase, this lady's 44 and not that history at all, but presented with an unexplained right-sided pleural effusion. And there's really, there's no nodularity, maybe a little bit of pleural thickening, but I think some of that's even intercostal vessel there. The only really thing she has is a couple little nodes, internal mammary nodes on the left here that are bigger than they should be. And they did a thoracentesis. I think this is this is right after they did a thoracentesis, I believe. I don't know if this is all just fluid right here. 
maybe a little bit of atelectasis there, but the thoracentesis had atypical cells. And so they went in and did a thoracoscopic uh, biopsy or pleuroscopy. And they, this was positive for mesothelioma. And the interesting thing about this one, and so there was no known exposure. And when they did genetic testing that they found this was a BAP1 uh, tumor uh, suppressor gene mutation. And I don't know if either of you are familiar with this. I was not, but this is another tumor suppressor gene, which was only identified in the last 10 to 12 years. It's, uh, it's BRCA1 associated protein one. So it's not BRCA, but it is, it, that's what the BAP stands for. And it is, it has a high association with, with mesothelioma of the pleuro, the peritoneum, the pericardium, and several other tumors, including uh, melanomas of the, the eye and other, you know, a bunch of other tumors, you know, no surprise with some of these, these tumor suppressor genes, but this cancer syndrome, UV, or it was um, uveal melanoma, whatever, I don't know, CM, cutaneous melanoma, yeah, renal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinomas. Um, but this has been increasingly recognized, first identified in a few families. The interesting thing about her is they, they tested her genetics and she did not have a germline mutation. So they think this is just a sporadic mutation, which can occur in some of these patients. And I think probably a lot of the time when we see mesotheliomas, albeit they're rare, but in patients who don't have exposure, this is one of the mutations they may have, which was unknown until, you know, until the last decade or so. You know, so, I was not. Oh, I was going to say, you know, um, I wonder, you know, we don't. I mean, mesothelioma is rare. I wonder if patients with asbestos exposure, if there's a higher rate of BAP1 mutations in patients who develop, not necessarily all, but meso, you know, as an additional risk factor. Yes, and um, yeah, and I think it did say that in here somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, well, yeah, no, it just talks about how there's minimal or no. Yeah, there's the occasional young patient we see with a peritoneal or pleural or even pericardial mm -hmm. mesothelioma. But you're right. I mean, maybe if they have, you know, they have some sort of susceptibility. Uh, but a lot of these patients in the familial version of this BAP will have on average between like two and seven cancers. And the prognosis is better for most of these cancers. You know, it's a lot like Lee-Fermini syndrome or, or these other tumor oncogene syndromes. The yeah. patients just get repeated cancers. So, so uh, you know, I've seen five cases of BAP1 mutations related to mesothelioma. <clears throat> I had one a couple of, um, couple of months ago that had kidney tumors and had a history of um, a uveal melanoma. So the other, you look very carefully at the, at the kidneys. This person had really an indolent kidney tumor that was just, just barely protruding. And a few years later, it was a little bit bigger and stuff like that. So it's really important to look at the kidneys very hard. And then if they have a history of melanoma, particularly the uveal melanoma, you're, you're, you're probably almost certainly dealing with the back one mutation. So um, <clears throat> I thought I showed one a couple of, a couple of months ago in this conference. I'll, you I'll you might out. have, and yeah. my attendance has been sporadic, so I apologize for missing it, but yeah. So this was the first one I had seen. This came up at our tumor board. So I just thought that was an interesting, you know, interesting cancer gene and all of these you know, genes that we increasingly identify now. All right, this is a sad case. This is a young patient teenager who had ALL, had a bone marrow transplant, relapsed a few months ago, and then just earlier this month came in with uh, skin lesions. They started with full body, blew up into a full body rash, and it was varicella. And this is a typical uh, radiographic appearance of varicella pneumonia, and this is an immunocompromised patient. And I know we've seen a few cases of CT in these patients, and you usually get these fairly discrete pox-like little nodules, and they often have surrounding ground glass on the CT. Um, I don't have a CT in this patient, but this this is a pretty good look on the radiograph. Like you guys can appreciate how discrete those little mm -hmm. nodules are and how diffuse it is. Uh, this one, 
unfortunately just progressed to full blown acute lung injury and clinical clinically had ARDS. As you can see here, they've just kind of fluffed out and bilateral stuff. And this was a couple of weeks later, so probably some organizing phase of lung injury. You can see some dilated airways and, and such. But um, he was started on valet cyclovir, no help, and unfortunately was DNR DNI and, and passed. He had some relapse of his uh, of his uh, leukemia as well. But I show that one to set up these other cases. This is another patient, and this was a, a baseline radiograph that was negative. And here was his follow-up radiograph. I'll actually get rid of this. His heart's a little, maybe a little generous, but outpatient. And he actually was, he was an adult, had never had the chicken pox. And his son was vaccinated, but this, this parent started with a rash on their nose and then developed you know, more just generalized body aches, fevers, some respiratory symptoms. And you can see here, again, not as flagrant, but there's definitely some subtle little fairly discrete nodules, both lungs, mid and lower lung predominance, maybe a few septal lines as well. Uh, and I think this is the lateral, yeah, from that time, just, just too busy, um, you know, in the retrosternal clear space and in the retrocardiac clear space. So this was another, uh, another varicella, and this one was confirmed. They did a, some sort of swab of one of his pox on his skin, and his IgG was negative for varicella. Uh, but he did okay. And I don't, have you guys seen much varicella, or do you see it every once in a while, or what kind of incidents do you think it, you, you encounter it? One time, and I think it was a mass like area of consolidation that was biopsied, and they recovered the virus. Really? Huh. Yeah. Well, I, th I think I've seen it once, once in, you know, in 40 years. But, uh, you know, <clears throat> small calcifications throughout the lungs, we used to say that was varicella. These days on the B reader exam, they've got small calcifications throughout the lungs and they call it histoplasmosis. That's right. But varicella used to leave little, you know, lots of yeah. little calcifications. Sure. It, and, and I've got a couple of cases of that, which were presumed varicella, you know, and I know I've shown one of those, and, and David, your first question was always, as always, like, are there splenic calcifications? And there weren't, and it was, you know, that's in the healed phase, and so I wonder if those, but anyway, that gets to the most interesting one, which is one I saw this week, and this lady's 31, and you can see she has a baseline from a couple years ago that's normal, and here's her radiograph, and I was just reading this in our outpatient stacks, and the history was like pleuritic chest pain, full body aches, fevers, and I just, again, I was, I was thinking is like, this looks a little funny. You know, they're very discreet. And so outpatient, I just called and talked to the clinician. we we'll say maybe trying to tease out any respiratory symptoms. And she had more of a, just a sore throat. Uh, and I just asked like, is she immunocompromised or does she have any risk factors for something like CMV or varicella? And she said, well, that's interesting because she's a kindergarten teacher and a kid just got sent home two weeks ago with varicella. And this lady had had a baby a couple of years ago, and they checked, I guess, when she was admitted at that point, they checked her varicella IgG titers, and they were negative, indicative that she had never had it. And they encouraged her to get the vaccine, and she didn't. So this is looks identical to those and is being treated as a presumptive varicella, you know, varicella pneumonia. She, at least as of, as of a couple of days ago, did not have a rash. Uh, but the rest of her symptoms fit and her exposure certainly fits. So they were going to check an IgM. They haven't, I haven't seen it yet, but I think this is probably another varicella pneumonia. What do you think? Sounds like it. it. And <laughs> she's also immunocompetent. She had pregnancy is a risk factor for pneumonia. She was pregnant a year ago. So that's not a current risk factor when I was doing some reading. So not being vaccinated. That's a good risk factor. Well, yeah. <laughs> and not having chicken pox as a kid. Yeah. yeah. So, all right. I will stop there and I'll all hang right. out for a couple more minutes and I'm going right, to yeah, leave. Duck out when you need. Um, I see Shrav is online. Do you have any cases this week? Yeah, I've got a couple. I'll make you the presenter. Thanks for joining. Uh, let's see here. This is screen and monitor number two. You're able to see this? Yeah, we see a, a baby CT. Okay. Yes, B 
baby CT. They're the best. Mm -hmm. um, so this patient um, has uh, complex congenital heart disease. They have hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Um, and just an interesting CT shortly after operation, patient still has an open chest. You can see here the patients had their Norwood procedure just performed. So we can see the, um, uh, the kind of single ventricle uh, physiology, morphology with, um, here you have your uh, DKS anastomosis, Damus K. Stancell, where the pulmonary artery trunk is anastomosed to the um, aorta and uh, patient gets an aortoplasty. So here we can see that um, the native aortic root is very, very small, and there is very severe uh, narrowing of that proximal portion. You can see, like the caliber of uh, the vessel right here is uh, small relative to how the caliber of the um, coronary arteries, and so you know there's some concern that there's not enough blood uh, able to flow into the uh, aortic root and supply the coronary circulation adequately. And so if we take a look on the, um, whoops, how do I bring this over here? We take a look on the 3D and you can see how pinched off that um, perinastomotic segment is. So just uh, an interesting, interesting post-operative or intraoperative appearance right there. So. That's case number one. And then here you can see the RVPA conduit and all of the other post-surgical changes. Case number two is another congenital heart disease case, but this is preoperative. I don't think I've ever seen um, this disorder present in this way, but uh, here you can see as we come down, actually, let's look at the delayed. Uh, you can see this patient has, an, it's another um, single ventricle patient, but um, none of the pulmonary veins are uh, connecting to the uh, either of the atria, and instead they're kind of communicating with this um, uh, venous confluence that comes down, and it doesn't usually in infracardiac uh, TAPVR or PAPVR, you know, you, you uh, sometimes you see scimitar veins that come down below the diaphragm, and they usually connect to the IVC. But this one courses uh, down here and connects to the uh, uh, the ductus venosus, and so that eventually connects to the portal vein. Uh, so just an interesting, weird uh, TAPBR infracardiac TAPBR case. Very cool. Yeah. I don't see those very often. <laughs> I have never seen one that connects to the ductus venosus. No. Often it's to the IVC, but that one was just super rare, so I thought I should show it. Um, this is an interesting case. This is uh, for the trainees on the call. This may be you know, relevant for boards and whatnot, I, I would think. So here we can see a very dilated pulmonary artery. There's lots of little large uh, collateral vessels here in the um, mediastinum. And as we come down, we see that there's this discontinuity in the intraventricular septum, pretty large ventricular septal defect. You can also see the right ventricle is very, very hypertrophied. And the beauty of this case is it was done in an, uh, kind of an early uh, arterial phase. And so you can see contrast going from the right to the left. And so this is Eisenmenger syndrome, where you have reversal and right to left shunting across this VSD, where normally you would expect left to right shunting. And so this patient has had a long-standing uncorrected VSD. I think there were probably, uh, you know, either, I think this patient might have been in their 50s or 60s, and so uh, this is never corrected. They got really bad pulmonary hypertension and Eisenmenger as a result, which you can see here on a static CT. Just a beautiful demonstration of that. And then if I can open up the last case here, this is more of a consult. Um, so this patient came in, uh, I think, not sure what was the history. Uh, I think they she had, let's see, she had a cough for three weeks is the history on the chest radiograph. And on the chest radiograph, this is what we saw, kind of this abnormal um, opacity here. We recommended a CT for follow-up. And so this is the CT. 
So here you can see that there's this area of low attenuation um, here in the posterior right lung. It's, it's in the right lower lobe superior segment. Looks like it has some dilated uh, pulmonary artery branches that are coursing in through here. They're sort of tortuous. Um, and then we can see also that there are some dilated tortuous intercostal vessels. I'm not sure if they actually communicate with the lesion, but I, you know, I didn't see any branches that were coming directly from the thoracic aorta with definite, like, you know, if we're thinking like a pulmonary sequestration or something. Um, and this lesion is uh, draining into the uh, right superior pulmonary vein. So pulmonary artery supply, pulmonary artery, uh, or pulmonary venous drainage, um, no direct arterial communication, but I'm not sure there's kind of conspicuous asymmetric uh, right intercostal vessels. What would you say about something like this? I think it's a pseudo sequestration. Um, I suspect it is getting supply from those intercostals because they have no good reason to be big otherwise. Right. And so at some point there must have been an infection or something there. Um, and these some and I think, um, yeah, right somewhere up in there. Okay. Yeah, it was just a weird. Not sure what this. David, do you agree? Yeah, I think so. Okay, interesting. A nice example of one. Yeah, it was just a just a funny looking thing. Uh, but that's all the cases I have. Thanks for the uh, consult on that one. Yeah, great. David, do you have any cases? I do. If I can uh, figure out where they are, here we go. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. All right, so this person has a normal chest radiograph in 2012, um, but there's a bit of a gap. And then we have a very abnormal chest radiograph. <clears throat> Here is um, the scout view showing a very large lesion at the left apex and another large lesion in the right base. And um, here is the left upper lesion. Let me give you a better window here. You see it's a very vascular tumor here with um, some necrosis it's very large um, and the one in the base looks very similar also lots of vessels some necrosis the coronal is dramatic those big swirly vessels here it seems to have a sharp boundary against the lung this one's definitely in lung and um, <clears throat> this came with the diagnosis of carcinoid which i think is you know i was pretty skeptical i thought either one of these looks pretty good for a solitary fibrous tumor this one being looks as if it's inside the lung though so it's not it's not such a great location i would expect a solitary fibrous tumor to be outside the lung so this <clears throat> they went in and resected this lesion here it was an extra pulmonary lesion it did have adhesions maybe had origin to the, from the visceral pleura of the left apex. It's also adherent to parietal pleura, but didn't seem to be invasive. And this was a solitary fibrous tumor with lots of malignant characteristics, a high mitotic rate, some necrosis and so forth. And this lesion down here, I presume is a, is a metastasis in lower lobe. We have not investigated this lesion at this institution, but I think it it looks really like the same tumor, mm -hmm. a smaller version. So I'd like this to be a a met. But uh, you know, I'm sort of wondering how did a met get inside the lung down there? I don't think this they they did not find signs that this had invaded the lung. It was adherent but not invasive of lung. So I don't think we had a pathway from lung on one side through the airway to get down to the right lower lobe. But this lesion will probably be investigated further and perhaps it is arising from the visceral pleura i have seen these solitary fibrous tumors grow into the lung rather than out into the pleural space they have pleural origin usually visceral pleural origin typically from the bottom of the right lower lobe or left lower lobe that's a common location but they can grow into the lung from that pleural um, lining and um, this the, both these lesions were hot on uh, PET imaging here. 
Any comments? So, you know, the, if you the, all the literature and all this, they talk about, you know, the, whatever percentage of these have malignant or aggressive features. Yet, of all the solitary fibrous tumors I've seen, I've never seen one recur, and I've never seen one metastasize. So, I I think that number is probably overstated, and it's probably because we pick up so many of them on CT now that probably went were clinically silent years ago when these papers were written. Um, but um, have you ever, other than this case, have you ever seen one metastasize? I don't think I've seen them metastasize distantly like this, but I've seen them, I've seen, I have seen malignant ones, I've seen them recur. And so they, you know, you know, they end up resecting it and then it comes back and you've got tumor all over the pleural space and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I don't think I've seen it uh, jump like this, pro probably through the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've seen that. Yeah, I thought you were going to say this. these were metastatic, like paragangliomas or pheochromocytomas. <laughs> uh, they were so vascular. But then I saw yeah, the kidneys vascular. on the coronal, and that kind of yeah. changed my mind on that. Yeah, I, I agree with you. This, this, I think this is the most vascular tumor I've seen, but it's uh, it's also a very large one. But look at the size of some of these vessels here. Yeah, and they weren't hemangiopericytomas or whatever they're calling those things now. Those weird quasi malignant, yeah. somewhere in between ones. They're they're letting it go with solitary fibrous okay. tumor wow. hesitation. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, this woman has a lesion in. Uh, Looks like right middle lobe here or the edge of right low right upper lobe and um this looks pretty um indolent looking here kind of low att lowish attenuation here very homogeneous uh nothing special and they biopsy this and this was this was a um lyomyoma okay and I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Does she have a history of, of hysterectomy? Well, she got hysterectomy after this. Uh, Does that count? Yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, it turns out that before she had the hysterectomy years ago, and when they did the, they did a hysterectomy, and they found a bunch of um, non-viable um, lyomyomas in her in her uh, uterus, so. She has fibroids. Mm -hmm. uh, they had been embolized, and so they were they were not viable, but they were the remnants of embolized treated fibroids. So I don't know if by injecting those things, whether you jostled things enough and you know maybe um, distended some vessels or something like that and managed to launch some cells into the bloodstream. But this is another example of benign metastasizing lyomyomas from. Uh, the result of pelvic interventions and jostling of the uterus. So this is the first one I've seen that was related to an embolization procedure. Mm. And it's but the only one, huh? People who get embolized probably have lots of fibroids, and so maybe they got there on their own, or maybe she had earlier procedures like a right. DNA or something like that that jostled things. So we don't always have complete history on these things. And there were no other nodules that... Just the one. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So a variant of uh, an unusual condition. Okay, and um, then let me show you this case. This is the preamble. So this um, this person had a fairly normal chest radiograph at this point. I think he had some symptoms, got a repeat radiograph um, about a week later or 10 days later or something like that. Now has some low-grade patchy consolidation, mostly in the bases, slightly peripheral. And it's very nice and uh, ground glassy, widespread, largely peripheral, concentrated at the bases, and so forth. And um, I don't know what the workup was at this time. This is this is years ago, but they um, they identified this as an eosinophilic pneumonia, and uh, she got better. She was probably treated with steroids. Uh, things cleared up. And they cleared up even more than this. This is about a week later. I think things have already started to clear, and they cleared all the way. And so she was fine for a long time. And then, um, then things started to come back. This is more than a year later, I think. So there was a gap here. And now we've got a very similar pattern to what we had before with this largely peripheral basal predominant 
sort of thing. And uh, another round of CT shows very similar peripheral ground glassy stuff, not as intense as the last time. And this is a recurrent eosinophilic pneumonia. So <clears throat> at this point, they're calling it chronic, but you know, the classic chronic eosinophilic pneumonia goes up to the aphases and sometimes is kind of cloak-like hanging off the, uh, the periphery and the sides of the upper lobe, so it's sort of draped along the top of the chest. This is, I think, is a recurrent eosinophilic pneumonia. I don't know that I would call it chronic, but I think recurrent is a better term here. So this yeah. is often the case, you know, if they withdraw that, you know, they have to treat these people for up to a year and then taper the steroids. If, if they, if you, um, if things clear up and you start to taper the steroids before six months, there's a high likelihood that these eosinophilic things will resurge. And um, that's what happened with her, but it was more than, I think it was more than a year that separating the uh, recurrences. Did, did they have any idea what the cause may be? Cause I mean, that may be why it recurred. Right, I haven't had a chance to go back to her. Right records and stuff because like the ones i've encountered that are usually like medication related or infection related which are less common in the u.s but i mean they mm -hmm. go away and they don't come back because they don't start the medication again whereas you know organizing pneumonia especially if it's autoimmune related the, if they taper the steroids it does occasionally you know flare up again because right um, the autoantibodies are still causing tissue damage and that's usually ends up being like an antisynthetase syndrome or myositis picture that may not have the clinical myositis quite yet. Yeah, I'll try to get some more history on this. And yeah. fill what, in. The, the one medication that to keep an eye out for that I've now seen twice um, is some of the progesterone preparations they use for um, fertility treatment. They're injected, they're, they're in some kind of oils, um, you know, um, medical grade, like I think it's linenseed or something. And those have been linked to eosinophilic pneumonias. I've seen it twice now in young women getting fertility treatment and you know usually you they're on it's on active treatment so you can usually tie it to that okay well and, they won't have that problem in alabama so um nope no. so that what, what an unexpected boon that will be for the women there got it okay <laughs> those are my cases all right thanks david i did show the bap one in um i think a month ago i remember yeah yeah and i think that person had kidney tumors the smallish kidney tumors and had a history of uh uveal melanoma and is 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 the bap one also the one they can stain for now to or some kind of do testing on because you know it used to be to diagnose mesothelioma you had to have a pleural biopsy and you had to see the mesothelial cells invading the extra pleural fat or chest wall because the um they you know reactive ones look just like um malignant ones it was the invasion but i remember we've seen a few over the last few years um on our tumor board we don't see very many mesos anymore but that the pathologists you know they can stain them for these even just off cytology now um and i can't remember if bap1 is one of the ones they could test for and if it's even some they can test for you know on tissue like that other than the genetics i don't know i yeah i think they have to do the genetics but i'm not sure so you know, I'm not up to date on what the biopsy requirements are and how much tissue they need these days. Okay. All right. Well, I have three cases I can share with you. Um, so this first case was follow-up of lung nodules, and this patient had been being worked up for, for a non-tuberculous mycobacterial infection. It was a 70-something-year-old female with a cough, and... Um, and this case just illustrates the importance of when you're looking at small nodules, you know, we always talk about distribution, but it can be, sometimes it can be difficult. Um, you know, a lot of it depends on the perfusion of nodules or the concentration um, and then how dense the nodules are. But if we look here and in the right lower lobe, you see there are all these nodules and many of them do appear to be branching, but you have to see what they're associated with. And this is a pulmonary vein here and you can see them branching around the vein, but you know, if you look at the pleura, they're not touching the pleural surface. But then if you carefully inspect this vein, you can see there's some nodules along it. Um, the fissure has a few, but again, we see all these little nodules, many are branching, um, but these aren't airways, these are, these are veins. Um, so 
um, there's an airway there and you can see there's some nodules along the periphery of it, but they're not, there's no dilated airways, there's no plugging of airways. Um, and, and if you look at this case, like look at this vein right here as well, you see all those nodules. What's interesting, um, so these are perilymphatic and not tree and bud. So the differential of course is very different. What's interesting also is if you look at the case and I'll, I'll mag out a little bit, but all of the disease or you know, almost every nodule, there's a few you know, scattered ones here and there, but it's almost all confined to the right lung, particularly that lower lobe. There's a little bit in the upper lobe here. Um, there's hardly anything on the left. Now there is a, a, a helpful hint um, in this case is the, is these, are these lymph nodes in the mediastinum. And while they're not big, and of course you can get big nodes or plump nodes with, with chronic infections, if you look at the, they, uh, these nodes, some of them have these very faint calcifications in the middle of them, like this one here. And you usually don't see that with MAC. And then this sort of soft, um, you know, putty, I like icing sugar, I've heard all sorts of different names, but you can see that, that it's getting a little denser, but this central calcification pattern and this relative symmetry, especially of these hyalur nodes like this and these faint ones, right? This is, for me, is just, I mean, it, it makes this a slam dunk sarcoid case. Um, and the not, even without the nodules, I would have called this sarcoid anyway, but the uh, nodules here are just um, illustrate our nice perilymphatic nodules. So uh, we can stop hunting for mycobacterial disease and, and treat our sarcoid, uh, which is a nice thing to do for the patient. But you can see on the coronal, it's really just mostly lower lobe disease, which sometimes sarcoid does. And, but I think this is one of the few cases I've seen where it's almost, it's not, you know, it's 99% on the right lung with, you know, sort of lowish perfusion, perfusion, but not, not, not just a few nodules here and there. All right. Um, this is, uh, let's see which case this is. Oh yeah. This is kind of a cool case. Um, so, um, I'm sure most of you have interventional pulmonologists and they occasionally see patients for airway problems, uh, you know, malacia, excessive dynamic airway collapse, the valves and stuff. Um, so this was a study done on the outside. Uh, it's a very interesting study. And so this patient carries a COPD diagnosis, but they were also concerned about a central airway obstruction. They'll often see this on PFTs um, where they, there's um, the abnormal flow uh, that suggests that there's a central obstruction. And if we look on this scan, when we get into the chest, you'll notice there's this pretty striking saber sheath trachea deforming. Let me go to a lung window. You can see just how narrow the trachea is from left to right, but it maintains its front to back um, shape. And you can see the cartilage is a little bit thick, but it's sparing that posterior membrane. And here it gets quite narrow at the level of the aortic arch. And then it opens up a little bit as we get further into the chest. And then we have relatively normal airways. You can see there's some emphysema. This patient, I think, had some fibrosis down in the bases. Um, but what's really cool is that we, they happen to do some expiratory images, and they did a really nice job on this at the outside hospital. They're not, they're not helical. And I think for airways disease, I would always do a helical scan. And I think, um, and we're, we're in the process of probably, uh, well, of moving all our expiratory to helical because we can do them so quickly now. It's actually easier for the patient and you're more likely to get a true expiratory phase. But what's cool about this case is this type of malacia where you see the, it's like the two, uh, the coaptation of the lateral walls of the trachea rather than the front to back uh, where the anterior cartilage is weakened and that it just splays out in the membrane with its normal anterior motion or with excessive dynamic collapse where the membrane's weak, it gets sucked up in there. This is another form of malacia where it's, it's, a, it's a lateral collapse. There's also a form of, of circumferential collapse where the membrane and the cartilage are weak. I've only seen that once, but this is kind of a, 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 kind of a cool one that I've, I don't think I've encountered where it actually coapsed during expiration. It's, it's just limited to that one little area there. Uh, but it was enough to cause central airway obstruction. And you can see as we get down here, we're kind of borderline normal, but not too bad. There's no air trapping distal to this to suggest there's a big obstruction, but just a very uh, unusual form of tracheal malacia uh, from, from a saber sheath deformity and, and chronic obstructive lung disease. But Jeff, I'm a, little, I'm a little surprised given the thickness of the cartilage there that, that I, I always assumed that saber sheath was a rigid abnormality. I'm surprised to see this suggestion of flaccidity rather than rigidity, because in, particularly in your case, that wall, that cartilage is thick. It is. So this doesn't quite, yeah, I'm surprised by this. Well, it must, it must be weak enough, or maybe it's just weak yeah. up here. And that's why it's with it sort of not taking its normal shape. Uh -huh. And that's, well, again, that's why it's not a very common 
finding. Yeah. Um, but this is concordant with the pulmonary function testing. So it's it's kind of a just I it's just a very focal area, but it's kind of cool. Got it. Yeah. Have you seen that before? No, I've not. Okay. I've seen shaded saber sheath, never one to this degree, and never with um, the suggestion that it was um, collapsing even further. Um, maybe maybe it's yeah. a rapier instead of a saber. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, this last case is kind of interesting. And uh, we're uh, so this patient actually presented with a stroke. Uh, it was a right MCA stroke. Um, and um, they were concerned it was an embolic stroke. Um, and so this is a CT angio looking for sources of embolism. And you'll notice all right away, the pulmonary arteries are little on the plump side, which of course by themselves doesn't always mean a lot. But as we look more, we're gonna start seeing some problems. So these peripheral arteries are big. That's usually not, that's not normal. And as we get down here to the right ventricle, you'll notice the, the moderator band is hypertrophied. There's bowing of the septum towards the LV. Uh, we see a lot of flow artifacts in here. The RV free wall is too thick. Um, and then as we come further down, you see that even the trabeculae of the papillary muscles, they, there's this filling defect, or if you prefer blob, low attenuation in the apex of the RV there. So, um, and nor this was a well-timed um, scan. So normally we get a good uh, systemic arterial enhancement. So this tells us there's there's a problem because we should see more contrast on the left side of the heart. I checked the injection pro uh, injection um, um, you know, the smart prep or whatever they call it thing, and it was all it was perfect. It was in the right place. The you know, usually by six seconds we see um, an, a rapid increase in the left atrial um, enhancement, and the up upstroke was really good. It just this patient's um, LV or whatever was not or was this RV is not pumping, so there's less contrast. And I'll show, if we look right here, um, we can see, let's see, it's up top. Right here is a little channel with some denser contrast in it than the left atrium. And if we follow it up, you can see it comes right in here and it's really hard to see, but there's a little bit of you know, brighter contrast there. Um, if you put on a cardiac short axis, you can see this, but this is a patent frame in ovale. So this patient has pulmonary hypertension and uh, with that embolic uh, stroke and this presumed clot in the RV, presumably they it, something went across the PFO and caused the stroke. Now you'll also notice there is there's pulmonary embolism too. So clearly something came from somewhere. There's what looks like a little infarct here. And then there, in some areas there's actually, and it's subtle, but this is what it looks like in a lot of cases. And uh, Seth has shown us over the years, many good cases, and I got to review a bunch with him of chronic thromboembolic disease. And you can get just little areas like this. We always think about the webs, the stenosis, the cutoffs, but these little sort of just very peripheral filling defects there, you know, thickening there, that's actually thrombus. So this patient has some chronic clot in there. And some of these just look a little not in the center, not your typical acute PE, there's not vasodilation. So there's acute on chronic pulmonary embolism. So this is probably a case of CTEF that has led to, um, that has been un undiagnosed that has led to pulmonary hypertension that then opened up a PFO and there was another thromboembolic event that led to a stroke. So these PFOs can be really hard to see sometimes, but always something to think about in somebody with a stroke, so the paradoxical stroke. Um, and, and, they, and, they, and they're not always open. A lot of times the, um, the tissues are, they're, they're up against each other, but they don't fuse, but the, the, the normally greater left atrial pressure compared to the right keeps that sort of door shut. It's like putting a uh, like a heavy piece of furniture over a trap door uh, and you know you can't lift it up. But if you get enough pressure in here, you can eventually open the door and you can get these um, paradoxical emboli. I think many years ago, Julie Takasugi shared a case of one where you could actually see clot hanging, like passing through the PFO on the chest CT. Um, we call it in, in flagrante delicto, right? Because it, <laughs> yeah, it was caught in the act. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so, um, this, so, 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 you know, this was um, the, the chronic clots in this case were a little bit more challenging and you kind of have to go through them very carefully. It's very, it's very easy when you see acute clot just to write everything off as PE, but you should always think in the back of your mind, like, like here's a little web right here. If you, especially if you see pulmonary hypertension, could there be CTAP? Most of the time when I'm asked to review a case for CTAP, it's not there. 
because uh, you know we look we review all our ph cases that get referred to our ph clinic um but uh it it is often misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed for a variety of reasons you, your scan isn't adequate uh, you don't suspect it or it's very very subtle um the the more obvious cases are straightforward another clue on this case is there's some really nice mosaic attenuation i forgot to show that and let me make the window a little contrast here but you can see yeah these areas of increased ground what look like ground glass are actually probably the normal lung with no increased perfusion and then you have areas of decreased perfusion um, and sometimes if you have striking differences, you can actually follow it back and find a, a cutoff or a, a big stenosis there. But you could imagine the VQ scan is going to show you a bunch of little rat bites out there. So um, more to come on this patient. Um, I think because of the stroke, it's making things a little bit more difficult as far as anticoagulation. But it's not a lot of central disease. So this isn't probably a surgical case. It's probably going to be more of an anticoagulation. But the big problem is the pulmonary hypertension. So, All Jeff, right. uh, the mosaic perfusion was originally described in, in CTEF. In the CTEF situation, it was called mosaic perfusion. Now we call it mosaic attenuation. Right. Uh, but mosaic perfusion was originally described precisely in this CTEF context. Um, I also thought as you were scrolling through that there was actually a little calcium in the wall of one of those right lower lobe pulmonary arteries. You so may well be right. That would, that would uh, go along with... Uh, pulmonary hypertension, but maybe, you know, maybe I just glimpsed an artifact because it wasn't very big. Um, yeah, I don't see one right now. Yeah, and another, I think another important thing is when you do get these mosaic attenuation cases, the first thing I like to do is look at the, um, the vessel caliber, because if the vessels are uniform in the dark and the light lung, it's probably right. a ground glass problem. Right. If there's a big vessel discrepancy, um, then you start thinking, air, you know, it's it's a perfusion difference, and it's either because of um, airway problems, more more commonly, or in this case, vascular problems. But one thing I have noticed that I don't, it may be described, but I haven't seen it. You know, usually they say do expiratory images. I think the clinical presentation is usually enough. But if you look at the areas of increased attenuation, the vessels are actually bigger than normal. Right. Whereas with with when you get air trapping, unless it's really severe. Um, there's usually not expansion of the vessels in the normal lung. And so if you just look in the left upper lobe, these vessels are much larger than their companion vessels on the other side. And you'll notice this is where all the ground glass is. So the, 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 the blood has to go somewhere. It's right, right. It's the same stroke volume, presumably. And so it has to fill the lungs. And so if you're, if you're occluded out here, you're just going to, and these are at this level, they're, 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 they're muscular sure. arteries, but they probably still have some elastin in them, but they can expand to comp to accommodate that blood volume. So you'll see them get bigger. So this did, this kind of discrepancy to me is also very helpful. And even if I don't have a contrast study, but at least thinking, could this be a vascular problem? So it, it's not just the vessels distended in certain regions, it's that they're extra scrawny in others, as you show on this section here. So if you look out at the lateral aspect of that right lung, I mean, there's, it's pretty much avascular. So scrawny right. vessels where it's too black is a really bad sign. That right. lung is even, even too clear. Uh, it's bad lung. Right. But you can see that with air trapping. But um, right. what, what I was trying, I guess what I'm trying to say is when, when you get the mosaic attenuation and you don't have expiratory images or you don't have history to know if there's an airflow obstruction, usually with, let's say, like bad, um, you know, constrictive bronchiolitis, the vessels don't usually get much bigger in the normal areas, whereas with CTEF, you seem to get larger vessels in the normal areas because you're, you're, that blood has to go somewhere. And because it's, it's actually plugged up, it tends right. to expand these more. And that's just an observation I've made over the years. Um, I mean, let, let, me, let, me, let me validate that with my own experience, because I've seen some people, I thought, I thought vessels are usually fat where the lung is ground glassy, even if it's an airway problem primarily, leading to reflex vasoconstriction. I mean, you, either way, you're shunting blood away from the poorly oxygenated parts of the lung if it's an air trapping problem. Mm -hmm. That means you're, you're gonna, that blood is still going to have to go somewhere. It's going to fatten up the vessels, I think, um, right. in the areas that are still perfusing. But let me let me check some of my bad constrictive yeah. bronchial cases. Like I say, if it's really bad, maybe, but like in milder cases, or like okay. you, you tend not to see as much. Because I think you can... You can there's still a you know there's still plumbing to send some blood down there versus if your plumbing's just completely clogged it has to go somewhere plus that rv is hypertrophied and, and pumping really really hard but right. i don't know i just observed it but 
maybe it's a selection bias too. Okay. All right. Well, that is what I have this week. Um, and I think we are done. So thanks for the great cases. Yeah. Jeff, could you stay on for me? I need to ask you an Osiris question. Of course, I'll stick around. Okay. All right, bye. Thanks, everyone. everyone else. You can go ahead. So um, I'd like to, uh, in Osiris, I like to label the comments column with a, uh, a case number so uh -huh. I can really group my cases and stuff like that. So I've been, I've noticed in the last couple of years, I've not, when I add something to the comments column, it doesn't get written into the uh, metadata. Um, and, you know, um, in the past it would, you know, there'd be this hesitation, it would, you, there would be this delay while it rewrote the metadata for a CT scan on every image. <clears throat> and lately it stopped doing that. Um, and I notice in the metadata, if I, if I display the comments column, if I look at the metadata, the comments column which is 0032 slash, sorry, comma 4,000. Mm -hmm. it's, it's labeled retired. Yes. And it, it I, I, I cannot edit it. So I can edit the metadata directly and Osiris will not display anything in the comments column. So it doesn't let, display it even though it's in the metadata. Let but me share my screen in Osiris. Image. I put the same thing in Osiris. And I can see that com that comments column lights up, and it doesn't. It's not labeled retired. Yeah. So do you see my screen? Yep. So this is my labeling template. I mean, I still run it through a, a more better. I mean, more better. A better DICOM scrubber. But this is how when I just quickly anonymize a case. So you can see that I yeah I used to use that as well. And so what I I started doing what uh, I think Travis did is I used the study description one. Okay. And see, I have ILD sarcoid in here. And so if I go, I don't have it low. Let's see. And so I, on here, I can do study description. You, I can see, you see I have infection, infection, airway, trachea, cyst, cor coronary, esophagus. So I use study description now because, because it has been retired. So who retired it? Because uh, uh, the DICOM oh. standard. I don't, I don't know about that because Horos, uh, the same case, if I display it in Osirix and pull up the metadata, it, uh, it says, says retired, but in um, Horos, it's there and it appears in the comments column. So the metadata is the same. Just display, it's, it's partly dependent on the display program. So... It's, so uh, what you're saying is when you have the comments field live like this, it's just empty. Uh, yes, right. The comments is empty. Um, and it, so it doesn't get saved there. So, but if you look at the metadata, well, you've, you've, uh, you've adjusted your metadata. So yeah, let me, let's see. I've in some older ones. Let's see. Uh, let's, let's try this. I had all these cases numbered. I had 3,000 of them and it's now all gone. It's, it's. So what I do, here's how I do mine. Um, I use the patient ID for my number. Okay, so something called, this is called patient ID, huh? Yeah, that one is there. That's a common one, right? So that's their medical record number. I replace that with my own number. So when I go to anonymize a case, I just increase this by one. I use the patient name for my diagnosis because it's a large text field. Right. And so I, I do like tuberculous lymphadenitis and subcutaneous abscess, 33 female, you know, bird hog Dubay syndrome with resected renal cell, 56 male. Mm -hmm. The age stays, the study description are like my keywords, infection, ILD, cyst, you know, things I can search for that may not show up in here it's just an, one extra way to find stuff because the problem is i got eight thousand plus cases now and i can't find what i always want to what i have and i right. use i i travis and i switched to orthanic which is an open source uh dicom database and and web server but it doesn't have a it has a viewer built in but it's not like osirix where you can get thumbnails i can quickly go down a list i can't there's no really user interface i'll show you what i when i let's see um I hope it's running. 
yeah so this is what I, this is what i see and you can see this is what i can search by so i could type in like um paragonomyces there are cases of paragonomyces hmm. but i can't actually i mean i can click on it and i can send it to my laptop i have a viewer that runs it's slow um but that's the only way i can look at it mm -hmm. um, without having to actually download it but i can't take a quick look at the thumbnails you can see it there it is so um there there's the paragonomyces right there but that's that's how i find cases now but the problem is is if i type in sarcoid i have to there's probably a configuration i just haven't figured out how to fix um if i type in sarcoid you know it only shows me so many cases but i probably have two or three hundred in here Mm -hmm. But if I do sarcoid pleura, you know, I think I can't use like, oh, I can't remember if I have to do like, yeah, see, it doesn't always work. But if I type in sarcoid here, and then I can use my study description to do like pleura, and then I can find pleural sarcoid. So what I did here is in the study description, I added pleura as a keyword. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I use the accession number to know who the case came from. So there's Travis. You know, there's that. Uh, if I go back to paragonomyces, um, you can see different people over the years. Uh, not paragraph, but paragon. You can see, the, you know, different people. Tan, Travis, you, Howard. So it's very easy to attribute a case if I need to. Got it. Yeah, oh. so that that's what I switched to a while back. Because, yeah, the, the thing is with Horos, though, is it hasn't really been updated in a while. So it's still kind of on the old standards. And I think, you know, Osirix, because it goes through the FDA as their MD version, they, it has to be compliant with DICOM. And, and some places use it as their PACs. So mostly smaller places. So you think this, this is a not an Osirix issue, but is a, um, is a DICOM? It is a DICOM. Yeah, they officially retired that field. So like our PACs, there's, there's no comments field anymore. Got it. Okay, well, I guess I should just uh, suck that up and and adjust to the new world. Do you okay. want me to send you a screenshot of this anonymization scheme? Um, I don't think I need that. Okay. If you but change I, your mind, just email me. So the um, the zero nine ten slash ten twenty that is the study description field. Uh, let's see. That first one, the top left. Yeah, and you can search in here and type in. Uh, let's see. Uh, study. Yeah, there it. Whoops, that's its code right there. So it's so uh, Cyrix lets you search by name and add it. Right. But it should be there already because it's a standard one. Okay. So zero nine ten slash ten twenty. Okay. Okay. Well, I will. Um, I'll just switch to that. Uh, you know, I was very surprised. I didn't think it was a DICOM issue since Horos was displaying it differently from um, that. But I, I guess there's a lot of interaction between the viewer and DICOM in terms of what appears in the metadata, the way it's put on on the screen. So, oh, okay. Yeah, Vasilius, I see you're on. Um, so, you know, in the U.S., we changed our clocks ahead. Was it a week ago, a week and a half ago? So I think Europe doesn't change to the end of the month. So it's actually, it's it's 3 p.m. Central time here in the U.S. now. So the webinar ended already. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I hope you're doing well. Yeah, so I don't know. Yeah, what yeah, over, yeah so it'll be an hour. Uh, yeah, you're off an hour until you change your clocks forward. Okay, okay. So we patient for another week. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank yeah, you. take care. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Okay, Jeff, the other thing I wanted to tell you is I'll, I will be away um, starting on the 3rd of April and I'm gone the following week too. So the, I think the 3rd is a Wednesday or Thursday, whichever it is, I'll be gone for two Thursdays. All right. So you'll be here next week, but not the following. Right. Okay. That, thanks for letting me know. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually not, I'm in town between now and May 21st. So I'm not going anywhere. So I'll be around to do the webinar. And um, okay. yeah, my residents have been watching it every day. Watching the uh, the uh, tape versions? Oh, watching it live. Watching it live, okay. Yeah, I, that's their teaching for the day. They get to watch the webinar. 
Okay. Do, do you remember the young woman that had dinner with us and Daniela uh, Carolina? Yes. So we're going to hire her. Good. Yes. Good. Good. She won't start till January of 2027, but that's, that's fine with me. She's <laughs> plan ahead. Yes, what, that's what I've what done. You, I've, what's she doing in the meantime? Then what, finishing her residency. <laughs> she has two more years to go. Got it. And okay. then what we're doing, what we, what I found is work now. I've hired two residents, um, and what I make the deal with them is, is they do uh, six months of chest electives their senior year, and then they do a six month fellowship in cardiovascular, um, if that's what they want. And then they, I count that as their whole year, so that way they can. It's kind of a little carrot. They can start their real job six months earlier. Good, good. Yeah, because I figure, I mean, if they spend six months with me, it's our, it, what's the difference than if they do it officially as a fellow? Got it. Yeah. That's excellent. So, so I mean, you know, it's a real credit to your program that you're able to hire the people you're working with. I mean, that's a real endorsement. Yeah, I, 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 I'm very pleased. I think everyone in the section has been very happy. We, you know, we needed some youth in the section, so it's very yeah. nice. Got it need to plan ahead. All right. Well, take care and I'll talk to you next week. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Yep, bye. bye.